understand in terms of our daily living. We thank you for your love, your care, your watchkeeping, and for hearing this prayer. We pray these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we are on Lesson 7, which is going, looking at the book of Mark. And Lesson 7 is entitled, Teaching Disciples. Teaching Disciples. How many of you have ever functioned as a teacher? Oh, come on. Everybody should raise their hand. That's exactly right. We've got some professional teachers back here. But we've all interacted with somebody in which we've been trying to teach them something. Like children, okay? Or being taught by somebody else. Okay. So I want to begin the lesson today by asking you a question. And the question is this. <clears throat> what was the most important thing or concept or point that Jesus needed to teach his disciples? What was the most important point that Jesus needed to teach his disciples? Somebody over here said, listen, I'd say that's a, that's a sort of good question, answer, but I won't give you much credit for it. I'm sorry? Humility. Okay, well, that's a good point. I'll, sir, here? Okay, he needed to teach them about the Father. Okay, yes, Geraldine? What God is like? Okay. Oh, all those are very good answers, but not the right answer. <laughs> Since I make up the answers to the test, you know how that goes, okay? Um, so, uh, let's see, how do I, what's my next question now here? Help you narrow in on this. Okay, let me ask you this question. What was the number one bad information that the disciples had in relationship to Jesus? Uh, yeah, Richard. That he wasn't uh, here to become king on this earth. He was here to not to quell the Roman Empire. Okay, Richard gets two points for that one. All right, very nice. So what did Richard just say? What was the number one misconception that the disciples had in relationship to Jesus? And the answer is, they had the wrong understanding as to who Jesus was and what he was here to accomplish. Now, the disciples, all of Israel, were looking forward to the coming of the who? The, the Messiah. Messiah. Let me ask you this question. What does the word Messiah mean to you? Anointed? Okay. Um, okay, let me ask you this. Let me ask you. Okay, yeah, let, let's, let's go down this reason. Okay, anointed. Okay, what else? L a leader. Okay, Richard? Savior. savior. Okay, now when you say Savior, what do you mean? You're Savior in relationship to what? Saving your soul. Uh, yeah, exactly. It, 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 it's, it's in reference to our condition as sinners, lost, and we need somebody who is able to save us. Okay. Now let me ask you. Okay, so now let me ask you the next question, follow-up question. What was the disciples' definition or understanding of the word Messiah? George, a little louder. Yeah, they they were hoping someone would come and overthrow the Romans. They were looking, they anticipated, they expected, they knew. 
that the Messiah was going to be the one who was going to conquer the Romans and free them and return them to a free and independent people. Yes, Geraldine. Save, save them from the Romans. Okay, very good. Excellent. Okay, point. I'm sorry, point there. Point there to George and point to Geraldine. But only one. Got to keep it. And Richard got two, yeah. Okay, now let me ask the next question. Follow-up question. What was the Romans' understanding of the Messiah? Okay, the Romans' understanding of the Messiah, as in terms of Ad, in, Adventist, in terms of Jewish culture, economy, etc., was that whoever this Messiah was, whenever he might show up, his function, his objective was going to be to stir up a revolt against Rome. Okay. So I'm going to come back now and ask you the question again. What was the number one most important point that Jesus needed to, no, just hold that for, that's for church, needed his, under, his disciples to understand? What he was here for to save the people on the earth. In other words, he needed them to have a true understanding as to what the Messiah was all about. Now, yes, what his mission was. Now, um, let's. I'm sorry? Point. Point? Okay. <laughs> Maybe you should come up here and be giving the points, and I'll just ask the questions and not try to keep track. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now, if you look at, we're going to look at this a little bit out of sequence here. If you look at Mark 8, and unfortunately I left my marked up Bible at home, and so I'm kind of... Mark uh, 8, 31. Um, we have the section here where we have Peter... Oh, let's see here. Verse 31 says, And Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. Excuse me, that's where I'm not where I'm going to start. Up above was 27, Peter's confession uh, as Christ. Now Jesus and his disciples went out of the town of Caesarea saying to them, Who do men say that I am? And they answered, Some say that John the Baptist, some say Elijah, others one of the prophets. And Jesus said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him and said, You are the Christ. 30. Then Jesus charged them that they should tell no one about him. Why did Jesus tell them not to tell anyone about what Peter had just said? To prevent him from what he came to do. Okay. So, partially, I'm going to give half a point there, George. Okay? Number one. <clears throat> I'm sorry, Geraldine. Because Christ knew that the people had a misunderstanding. Okay. And if the disciples were going around saying this is the Messiah, it could have slowed his progress with their thinking. Okay. So I'll give you half a point. Same thing as George. Okay. Only half a point. The reason Jesus says this is because, number one, Peter doesn't even understand what he's just said. Peter thinks that when he says the Messiah, he's talking about a conquering king who is going to come and drive out the Romans. 
That's Peter's understanding at this point in time. And, as some of the half-pointers here have said, <laughs> everybody else out there thinks that too. And so Jesus knows <clears throat> that if the disciples, if Jesus acknowledges them and says, yes, you're correct, I am the Messiah, and they go out there and they start talking about Jesus being the Messiah, it's going to be within the context of the wrong understanding of what the Messiah is really all about. And in fact, the reason I know that is because, and this is where I got my mixed up here, if you look at verse uh, 31, what does Jesus then start doing? He starts to try to help the disciples understand that in fact their understanding of the Messiah is completely wrong because in fact he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected, killed, and only after three days raise up again. And what does Peter do here? He rebukes him. He said, pulls Jesus aside. Says, what are you talking about? This doesn't make any sense. Why didn't it make any sense to Peter? Because, because his misunderstanding. That's exactly right. Yes, ma'am. I, I want to go back to where, remember, with the 5,000 was fed. Oh, yes. And, and he went. Yes. They came to him. They wanted to make him king. Of course. Right there. Yep. Because they thought, well, we'll get food. Yep. Well, he's going to take care. The Lord did not want this to happen like that. That would be the wrong. <clears throat> well, it would derail the whole thing. Exactly. Because, and again, if you look at, if this gets out, okay, you've got the people getting quite excited about this. What are the Romans going to do? They're going to move in right away. They're not going to allow this to continue to fester. They're going to shut this thing down right away, and they know how to do that. All they have to do is take out one person, and it's done. Now, let's go back now to Sunday. And we have this, 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 this um, healing. Uh, let's see, this is in Mark 8, 22. And it says, they, and, when, and then he came to Bethsaida, and they brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. And so Jesus took the blind man by the hand, and he led him out of the town. And when he had spat on his eyes and put his hands on him, he asked him if he could see anything. And the blind man looked up and said, well, I see men like trees walking around. Then he put his hands on his eyes again, and this time made him look up and his re he was restored and he saw everything clearly. And Jesus sent him away to his house saying, neither go into the town nor tell anyone in the town. So what's odd about this parable? Richard. He had to do it two times. What happened the first time? He, he only partial surgery it didn't work. <laughs> George just said the cataract surgery didn't work. Yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> Had to come back for a laser, didn't he? <laughs> Geraldine. Instead of, instead of stating that, that he had to do it twice, if he had a two-step process, he chose to do it in two steps. Well, obviously. I mean, I don't think it was a matter that he failed the first time. But, okay, then let's ask the question, why does he do it in a two-step process? Donna. He's proving to them that 
they don't see clearly all of them. And with this blind man, he's showing them just the problem with father. Um, in terms of spitting, I can tell you, you've never lived in a third world country. Okay. <clears throat> so what is, the, what is the point, though? Of what is Jesus... I mean, okay, if we, if, we, if we take the position that this is not something that... This was not a failure on, God's, on Jesus' part to heal, but in fact it was, a, it was intentional, what was the point? So let me ask you this question. As a student, have you ever sat in a lecture and you're following along? I, I'm thinking of math right now. Math is not my strong part, but I made it through it. You're following along, it sort of makes sense, but at the end of the lecture, you know you really don't understand the principle that was being taught. You go back and you have a second look at it with the professor. And he points out a few things. And this time it just clicks. It makes sense. Pam. <coughs> oh, yeah. <coughs> yes. Pam refers to the aha moment after something, you know, you've read something in the past that, you know, is, is a story that you're familiar with, but it didn't really click in anything special. But later on, it's like, oh, wow, I see something now I didn't see before. Okay. Yes. So what is, what is the objective of this miracle? <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll give you a point. <laughs> yeah. Because that's for the power. Yeah. It's not God. He would have seen as soon as the mud was put on him and gone away, healed, people would have attributed this magic mud and God would have given the magic mud to go around <laughs> Then when, when he okay. see, and Jesus simply spoke to him, and he could see. It wasn't any more money. Okay, okay. well, I'll, I'll give you a point for that. The, the problem that I have with that answer, good as it is, is the fact that you don't see this in any other miracle that Jesus make, does. I mean, there's no other miracle where, you know, he, f he heals half of the lame leg and he's not ha hobbling quite as bad. And so he comes back for a second healing. And this time he's, it's back restored and he's on his way. This is, the one, this is a one offer. So let me ask you a question. I'm going to ask it again. What is the primary focus of this miracle? It is a blind man whose what is restored. Okay, now let me ask you a question. What is the significance of sight? How many of you have said, oh, I, I see now. I get it. So what is the point of this miracle? It is to teach a lesson to who? To the disciples. Okay, I'll give you a point there for sure. It is for the disciples. And it is for the disciples to help them understand that what they thought was a correct perspective was in fact not a correct perspective and in fact could be very different at a second look. In other words... The man was born blind. Jesus healed him the first time, or he, he touched him his eyes the first time. And how did, how did the man describe his, his, his vision? Vaguely. 
People look like trees moving around. I don't know how he knew what trees look like and what men looking like trees look like, but anyway, that's what he described them as. Did, did he know that that was not the way vision was supposed to be? Yeah, I just realized that as I asked the question that maybe my... But I, I, I'm assuming here that this man was, let's say, born blind. He had never seen and so Jesus heals him as he was. He sees as trees moving around. As far as he was concerned, he was seeing amazingly better. He thought it was correct. Until Jesus did what? Touched him again. And this time he saw 2020 3D, the whole shebang, full color spectrum. Now, let me ask you a question. Who else in what we've talked about today was blind? The disciples. The disciples were blind. They had a misunderstanding as to what the Messiah was all about. They thought it was correct. They thought this was the way it was supposed to be. That was all they had ever known. Jesus comes along And he begins to open up things to them, and they begin to get um, some interesting ideas as to what is, could, could happen here. I mean, imagine, he can make food, he can heal. I mean, their understanding of the Messiah, still within the context as the savior of the Jewish nation, from the Romans was looking pretty good. But it's only after the second healing, the second clearing of their vision, which didn't happen until when? I'm walking down here in time. Oh, yeah until after the crucifixion, after the resurrection, etc., etc., that they began to see things clearly. And so this healing, this miracle, yes, it restored the vision of the blind man. Praise the Lord for that. But it was also an illustrative parable, if you will, for the benefit of the, of the, of the disciples to help them understand in retrospect, I believe, I don't think they understood it at the, at the moment in time, that in fact, their, their, un, their, their seeing, what they, what they knew they were seeing, was in fact not reality, but in fact was gonna be very, very different. And they would see that, they would understand that, only within the context of what had happened through up until after, at least after the resurrection. Richard, sorry, I've, I've been. Well, when the blind man approached Jesus, yes. he knew him as a healer, but he had no idea why he was able to heal. Exactly. And it's <clears throat> probably similar to the disciples. <clears throat> you know, it's interesting, this story. It doesn't even appear that the blind man was looking for to be healed. He was brought by other people. He said, here, can you heal this man? And, and the guy ends up walking out there with his vision restored. I mean, it's like, wow, amazing. Claimed to be healers. Sure. Too. And as far as the blind man was concerned and the people that brought him there, all they knew was this man was able to heal. Yes, yes. Done. Laodicea says that spiritual eyesight, anointing my eyes with the spiritual eyesight. Ah, yes. And one of the things that Jesus said all through his ministry, you're blind, you don't see, you don't hear, you don't all the <coughs> And I know for a fact that if a woman in the whole church praying for me, when I was doing my Sabbath, my lessons, mm -hmm. Sure. Because I thought it meant something. Sure. Even though it said seventh day, I did 
did not see it. And I'm just saying, spiritual eyesight is very important and that the disciples didn't have that spiritual eyesight, even though <clears throat> he was trying to give it to them. So, so then the question comes up, what does it mean to see clearly? I mean, in the, in the context of this healing, seeing clearly from the blind man is very different than seeing clearly that the disciples needed to have. The disciples were um, intellectually blind. They had the wrong view as opposed to the blind man who needed... Yes, sir? Is it kind of like today? Exactly. So again, this is where there, there's all kinds of, of examples that we can come up with in terms of, of where people believe one thing that need to transition to something else. I mean, you know, think of the, the history of this church, the, the Millerites. They thought, they understood that in 1844, Jesus would come. They were, they were blind to certain things, but their eyes were open. They began to understand things differently, and they recognized they got that sorted out. <clears throat> so, again, yes. Oh, yes. Right before the healing of the blind man. Okay. I, it ties right in with, with what you're saying, and I think it's helpful that the disciples were confused and mixed up on the whole bread issue. And Jesus says to them, why reason ye because ye have no bread? Perceive ye not yet, neither understand. Have ye your heart yet hardened? Having eyes, see ye not? And having ears, hear ye not? And do you not remember? You know, he is telling <clears throat> them that they're not understanding things. Right. And then he goes on and so it just, I mean, he sets the stage for what this parable is all about. And, I mean, and again, if you look at the flow here, you've got the, <clears throat> the, the, right before that, of course, you have the leaven of the Pharisees. Well, what is that? The leaven is ref ref referring to bad information in terms of the kind of person God is and what the Messiah was all about and what they were looking for. And so, you know, it, it, this, is a, this is a book that flows, <clears throat> um, again, in terms of the focus of the lesson of the day, teaching the disciples, <clears throat> what was the number one thing that Jesus needed to teach the disciples about? Who he was, and why he was here, and what he was going to experience. Because it was very, very different from what they thought was going to happen. <clears throat> and it wasn't until actually after the crucifixion, after the resurrection, that, that it began to finally come through as to what it was that Jesus was all about. <clears throat> okay. Now, <clears throat> moving on, let's see. Well, let's look at Mark 9. <clears throat> um, um, I don't quite understand here. Jesus sent out his disciples to heal. Yes. And they couldn't heal this guy. And uh, why? Wouldn't they, wouldn't they be praying? I mean, that, that would be one of the first thing I would think. Wouldn't they be? So, so in other words, you're talking about after the transfiguration. Is that the, the story you're talking about? The son, the man whose son was demon possessed? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so let's, let's look at this in sequence here. <clears throat> so, oh, uh, let's see. Where am I now? So, um, so we, he began to teach. We have Peter then who, who takes Jesus aside, rebukes him. And what does Jesus say to G Peter? He says, get behind me. And what does he, how does he identify Peter? As Satan. Interesting. It just doesn't, doesn't just refer to him as Satan. He gives the reason. Get thee behind me, Satan. Because you savor not. You don't like the things that are of God. You know, he, 
he's not wanting God's way. Exactly, right. So let, let's just read that. So, okay, yes, I would agree with that. It says, get me behind me, Satan, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. What does it mean to be mindful? Understand, okay? But, you know, the, I like the King James here, for thou savorest not. You know, when you savor something, you like it. But okay. if you don't savor it, you know, they they don't want, they're not, what they want is a redeemer from Rome. Exactly. Exactly. Oh, no, I, I don't disagree with that. They, that's exactly. But that's not what God's plan is. That's not what God is, and that's not what Jesus is trying to communicate. <clears throat> then we have the section here where it talks about... Um, uh, taking up the cost of discipleship, <clears throat> and that in fact involves taking up that cross, which Jesus is now talking about. And then <clears throat> we have the transfiguration. So Jesus now takes four, excuse me, three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John, and he goes up to the mountain and he is transfigured. Now, what does the term transfigured mean? Changed. Changed. Okay, I'll give you a point. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm sorry? Appearing sinless. Appearing sinless. Okay. Um, so what, so what was different about Jesus as he walked here on this earth? versus how he was in heaven. What was the difference? His divinity, his divinity was covered, or in the background, his... Okay, so we understand that... Again, I don't know... Excuse me, when I say we understand, that's a bit of an overstatement, probably. Um, we believe that when, when Jesus came to this earth he took on humanity but he did not reveal his divinity and he walked as a how as a human he did not take advantage of those characteristics that we typically apply to god um, omnipresent omni knowledge etc yes what is divinity? You want me to answer that question? <laughs> yeah. Um, I think um, at the best I can do is to say that it is whatever God is. That is not what we are. So he has powers that we didn't have? That we don't have. He wasn't made just like Well, that. so... <clears throat> so he had more power so he could shun sin a lot better? That, okay, so let's, let's not get too off the rabbit trails here. Again, Jesus came to this earth and walked the human experience like you and I walk that experience. The only way he was successful in terms of beating back the temptations of Satan were because of the Holy Spirit working in and through him, just like you and I have the ability to, to tap, tap into. He was born and he was made in the flesh. He was made in the seed of the Are you with me or disagreeing with me? <laughs> I'm not sure what we're doing here. No. Let's get that straight. Get what straight? Yes, that's correct. I'm not saying that. 
I haven't said that. So again, his divine component was not in play as he walked on this earth. Yes, son. Yes. Was Christ not divine? Yes. Because if he was not divine, then how could he die for our sins? Correct. So there's a dichotomy here that we humanity has struggled with throughout the ages. Right. That Christ was both fully human, fully right. man, and fully God. Correct. There has to be both. And we don't understand that fully. Just like we don't understand. You know, the, the triune God, the three in right. God. But you can't say that he was not the God. Right. You cannot say that he was not man. Right. So, again, I, I don't know how, yeah, it's, it, it's, a, it's a topic that is, but, so when we say transfigured, what does that mean? What took place on that mountain? Donna? Okay. Yes. But the transfiguration took him beyond that and revealed who he really is, the Son of God. And Elijah was a seeing there. And when he told them, he said to them, I tell you right now the truth. So standing here right now will not die for this kingdom of God arriving with great power. He was revealing to Peter, James, and John exactly what yeah, um, I, I'm not quite sure about the word exactly, <laughs> okay, <clears throat> um, but he was revealing in, in so, he was revealed in some way by God, and, 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 I, and I think that's an important distinction. I don't believe that this was something that Jesus did as much as what God, the Father, and the Holy Spirit um, made happen in a way that communicated to Peter, James, and John that this person that they had walked with and lived with and interacted with, who appeared to be a man, was in fact something much more, even though that was not revealed in the day-to-day -day interaction that he had with, with us. He was not the Volkswagen, he was the Tesla, okay? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> yes, Geraldine. In transfiguration, I think of it more of, there was no change in Jesus in his, in his makeup. It was more of a, as he walked for the 33 years on this planet, visually, he was only his humanity was visible but that one brief moment of transfiguration um, physically his divinity shone through so he looked divine but there was no change in him i mean he was still jesus yes i mean i fully divine. okay the transfiguration transfigured his figure his physical appearance had a the divinity flash came through okay so if we go back to moses moses yes mountain, yes when moses came back down he appeared different right does that mean that he looked like a different person no everybody knew it was moses but the glory of god was revealed through you glory of God was <clears throat> upon him. And I believe it's an example to an extent as to what happened in Christ in transfiguration that the glory of God was revealed. It had been held back or it had been veiled, if you will, from humanity. But it was then seen shining forth. Okay. When, when Jesus <clears throat> that was a big difference. Nobody else is from the grave. No person Okay, but now let me ask you a question. Why did Jesus rise from the grave? 
<laughs> okay, I believe that the answer is, is because... It's God's choice. Okay, I better not go off those tangents. Let me ask you this other question here. <clears throat> Who else was on that mountain? Elijah and Moses. <clears throat> Why Elijah and Moses? Okay, number one, they were, at this point in time, they live where? In heaven. Okay. Why are they down here now? Okay, one of them, Moses what? Moses had died and had been buried up on Mount, whatever it was there, in, outside of, of, of Canaan. Elijah had what? He was taken up by a chariot alive. Okay. And how we understand this is that these two men are representing two groups of people. Those who died and those who, who will be alive when Jesus comes. Okay. What is their concern? Why are they there? Okay. He wasn't getting it from his disciples. He, he wasn't getting it from his disciples. Oh, that's, that a, that's a black mark on their name. Yeah. <laughs> Jeannie. If Jesus had failed, they were no longer in heaven. Okay. So, <clears throat> I think they, they are there um, as representatives for the entire fallen race every one of us they know the stakes that are at play here they know more about the plan of salvation than any uh, anybody else and they are there to encourage to um, support to let jesus know that even though it, it doesn't look good down here at this point point in time that there are those who have a very vested interest in what he's doing, and they want that to be. He is a soul. <clears throat> exactly. Now, they come down from this mountaintop experience, and they find the chaos. Uh, uh, let's see. Do we want to go there or not? Um, can we pass on that one? <laughs> I w what I want to go to very, very quickly because we're running out of time here, is on Wednesday. <clears throat> and that is this. Um, the disciples are following Jesus. They're going into town. <clears throat> but they're not with Jesus. Where are they? They're walking behind him. And Jesus, just like a parent. So what were you guys talking about? Who's going to be the greatest. the greatest? Okay. What does that little section tell us about where the disciples are at at this point in time? They are still seeing as men walking as trees. Okay. They still don't understand what Jesus is all about. Now, let me ask you this question, because this is really the important question. Do we see this today in this world? What do most people believe is going to transpire? We're looking for what? The rebuilding of Jerusalem. We're looking for a, a time of prosperity. We're looking for the saving of all this or that. Okay? And we must be very careful <clears throat> that we continually ask God to open our eyes to help us to see what is happening. 
You know, I don't know about you, and I, I, I'll, I'll step into this space very carefully here. I, I really don't know what's happening with this election cycle. It's crazy. But you want to know something? Um, I, I am really interested in seeing what God has in plan. We just what is going to happen? We just leave it in the essence. Well, we have to live here too. Um, you know, Ellen White talks about the fact that the principles of the American Constitution are going to be completely done away with. And I've read that stuff and I've thought to myself, really? That's crazy. Can you see that happening? I can. I, and, I can and I can see it both ways. I'm not sure which way is, it's going to happen. So, you know, <clears throat> the good news is this. <clears throat> While we may be as the blind man, we have the opportunity of having our eyes opened if we will stay connected to the God who is really in control of everything. Amen. He raises up and he puts down. And I have no idea which is the right way for this to go in terms of what we know, what we want to have happen. And that is we want this thing to be wrapped up, right? You know, the problem is we want it to be wrapped up in a, uh, in a comfortable way. <laughs> Well, it could become a really wild road. I don't know which way it's going to go. Well, we do know it will be a wild road. But I, I'm just, but it's going to be, it's going to be an interesting deal. And I... I have no idea what the sequence is going to be. All I know is, is that I'm, I'm looking forward to when Jesus comes. And that, to me, is what we need to be looking for. And however that can happen, and we can be a part of the, at the closing events in a positive way, in terms of God's character, and, 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 and making known his plan of salvation, that is what our focus should be. Yes, Kelly, one last comment. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Well, let's let's bow our heads and let's have prayer. <clears throat> Father in heaven, as blind people, we ask that you would heal our eyes. Help us to see what is reality. Help us to not be distracted by crazy ideas. Help us to recognize that this is a spiritual war and it is not just a political disagreement. May your Holy Spirit be with each person and may your healing touch help each one of us to see what you want us to see. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The thing about it